I think we can do it better for uh, him. <laughs> Mr. Evans Asari, the manager for KPMG, outlining to us not just the opportunities there are within the budget that businesses must take advantage of, but of course the risks involved. I was interest, it was interesting to hear the concern of our capacity building amidst the 3.4 trillion you know, US dollar market under the continental free trade agreement area. But for those of us listening once again, this is the GNCCI virtual seminar on the 2021 national budget. And the theme under this discussion we're having so far is it's the, the, the entire budget and the prospects for recovery, resilience, and competitiveness for private sector growth. Already we've had interesting presentations from our esteemed guests. And we're going to be continuing with the presentations because this time around, we're going to be fixating our attention, fixing our attention on the taxation bit of the 2021 budget. Before we're live on Joy FM, we're having this discussion by the KPMG partner, Mr. Kofi from Pong Corey, on the strategies to boost business growth and value for private sector when it comes to the taxation bit of the 2021 budget. I'm pleased to announce that he is here once again to continue his presentation. And please help me as he comes onto the stage for this all important presentation. Thank you. Thank you once again, Charles. And uh, I think my work was paused, but I mean, the pause was for a good thing because uh, a number of presenters or speakers have quite delved into some of the key areas that I was also meant to, to comment on. So that, that will make it much, much faster and quicker. Just before I left, I mentioned the stamps for small businesses and the fact that that will give them room to manage their finances and their resources in their operations. Because you know, working capital is very critical as far as businesses are concerned. So once the government is giving us that opportunity to postpone the payments, and I want to emphasize the word postpone, it is not that we are not supposed to be paying the taxes. So as businesses, we need to be mindful when we are doing our plans. We've been giving the opportunity to use the money now and pay later. So what it means is that in our planning and in our own budgeting, we set aside how we, we accrue and how we plan to pay this subsequently when it is due. I also earlier on mentioned the fact that we need to engage as, as an organized labor, as bodies, to engage with the uh, GRA, with decision makers, policy makers, and also to be able to voice out some of the issues where we believe that they could trick it a bit to make us much more beneficial, especially with the rebates that have been given to the tour, 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 tourism, hospitality industries, as, as I mentioned, because we all know they were hardly hit, and a number of them are making losses. And in so doing, they may not be able to benefit from, from the rebates. So, if they can change it some way, somehow, to benefit them. Those are the strategies that I also, also indicated that we ourselves need to do an introspection, analyze our business, and know where the risk points are, where the tax exposures are. And once we get to know, then we can then, based on that, go to the revenue authority, arrange for the payment, and in so doing, have a benefit of all the waivers of the interest and the penalties that the government is proposing in this budget. If you do not do and the window is closed, that task burden will still be on, on, on us. And, and I believe that it's very critical that we utilize this opportunity because sometimes the penalties and the interest end up even being more than twice the task liability itself. So, so that's why I keep saying that as one of the key strategies that we need to do is to sit back and analyze all the transactions. And in this one, it covers all tax areas. We are not only looking at corporate taxes, our VATs, whether it's flat rate or standard rate, our PAYE, our withholding taxes, these and many other more that we are required to be doing. Have we been doing them? In filing our returns, have we been up to date? And we have not, we can then estimate all these liabilities, all the penalties and other things. Now the government says just come and arrange and pay only the amount. And as I keep saying, there was a similar one where the amount itself was just about 300,000. The interest and the penalties ending up almost to be about three million Ghana cities. So, so you can imagine what the government is trying to give us by giving us this opportunity. So please, businesses, let's go back, let's sit down, 
if you could not do it, let's get in touch with accountants to consultants and things. Let them assist us to take advantage of some of these benefits. In some of the taxes as well in the budget is also to assist taxes and trotros as far as the vehicle income tax is concerned. I'm sure we are all aware that a number of commercial car owners and things also pay the vehicle income tax. Government is also suspending the payment of these taxes up to December. Once again, a suspension. If you suspend something, you will reinstate it. So, so, so I want us to, to be mindful the words that have been chosen in the budget. I'm not providing these, these, these words. It's how it has been written so that we are mindful that it's not some freebies that have come that we, are, we, we need to spend now. It will be waiting for you in, in future. So be mindful of that one as well. But for me, it's also very good for, especially for those operating the commercial vehicles as well, they'll be able to have the resources to manage their businesses as they go for it. Then beyond the, the, the benefits or the reliefs and things came the key taxes as well. So as government is giving with the right, it's also taking some with the left. Or as it's take, give, taking with the right, it's also be taking some from the left. So, there was the introduction of the financial sector cleaned up levy of 5%, and this one particularly is on the banks. For now, that's what the budget states. But in most cases, you realize that when the budget statement is read like that and it's being implemented, you end up finding that some other industries or other uh, uh, sectors have been squeezed into it by the allies that are issued. So I'm speaking now as the budget has been read that it's going to be on the profit before tax for banks. So what it means is that the banks are going to suffer 5% on the profit that they make in addition to what is currently existing. So we need to be mindful so that we have already a national fiscal stabilization levy that the banks are also paying. So that in, in effect will make the banks pay 10% of their profit before tax. And this amount of money that they will pay is not deductible for tax purposes. So it's going to be quite challenging for them. But of course, another school of thought has said that the banks are, are, have also benefited from the financial sector cleanup based on the interventions that the government gave and other, other, other issues. So, but of course, we have our MD here, and he will probably allude to it, whether indeed that is how, how the situation is. But the fear or the risk there is that how is the banks going to manage it? Is it going to be a cost that will be absorbed or a cost that will be passed on? In whichever way that it is, you see, this, this, I mean, it's like a vicious cycle. If they absorb it, then what it means is that their, their costs and operations and other things will go up. And once their operations and other things go up, it also ultimately will impact on their final cooperators that they will pay. If they pass on to businesses of course, then price increments and other, other things will also will be the things that we are looking for. And of course, looking at the fact that the general budget itself is also looking at an 8% inflation rate. I don't know how increases with some of these taxes and things will, will also help us achieve that, that inflation rate. So it's a whole cycle that we need to also, I mean, critique it or look at how best we can, I mean, in, in the midst of all this. And I keep saying that between January and now, I'm sure our mothers and our brothers and our business people will realize that prices have inched up. Prices have inched up just between January and now price of income, and that in itself, I mean, for me, is a fear that might push the inflation rate and other things up before other things come in. With all these taxes also come in. We then need to see how that can be balanced in achieving the 8% inflation rate as well. There's also the health levy, what they call the COVID-19 health levy, and that is in twofold. One, on the National Health Insurance Levy, that is going to increase from 2.5 to 3.5. For businesses, this is also going to be an extra cost. Because as we know, the levies are not, do not operate just like the, the normal VAT. The levies are costs that you cannot claim. So it becomes part of your cost. So once again, the issue is, how do we manage this extra cost that, that, that is coming? Do we pass it on to consumers, or we absorb it? If we absorb it, it's once again, also reduces the tax that the government is even looking forward to raise from corporate taxes. If it passes on to consumers, 
it will end up increasing the cost of operating, the cost of living, and everything else, and it also delve into the other areas that I've already mentioned. Then the flat rate, also going to increase from 3% to 4%. And I'm sure the flat rate issue, we've been discussing the flat rate issues for some time now, especially for manufacturers and for those who do imports and other things who are within the flat rate. Because at the ports, when they are claiming their goods, some of them pay the standard rate. And because they, they pay the standard rate at the port and they are charging the flat rate, they are not able to do anything about the standard rates. So what it means that the standard rate becomes part of their cost. So that has been the issue that manufacturers and importers and other things had been discussing to see. Can they also be made to pay the same flat rate at the ports? But you know at the ports, when you bring the goods, that, that, that issue is also not there. So that is also area that, once again, businesses and other people can also look at and, 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 and see, can we negotiate, can we discuss this? Because what it means that it increases their cost. That 17 half percent, who they have, have, have far to claim, because they are charging the flat rate, they have no room to be able to I mean, claim that one. So it becomes part of their cost. So this is also one area that government is also seeking to raise revenue. And, and uh, for, the, uh, for businesses, we need to also be mindful how we manage it. And that's some of the issues that I'm discussing. Then, of course, there's also the sanitation and pollution levy. As my colleague alluded to, we are struggling to manage our sanitation, our waste, sorry. In my house, for the past, three for the past month or so, the waste people had not set foot there. The good news for me is that I'm left with only my wife at home, so we, we do not make a lot of waste now. <laughs> so, so, so otherwise, you could have imagined how piled the, the waste will be, will be in the house. So I believe that we, we all should probably should commend the government with coming up with these things. But sometimes it's good the policies come, and as I keep saying, how we implement it and how this money is also used to also to advance the cost of the business. That's where the issue is. But I will appeal that these are some of the things that will help us all be able to manage the, the waste and things that we have to But that one is only uh, going to be a 10 percent on the price of fuel. So the sanitation levy is not going to operate as the as a, uh, NHIL or the flat rate. This rather is going to be on the price of, of, of fuel. So for every liter of fuel that we buy, there will be a 10 percent increment for, for, for all of us and for businesses as well. I'm sure. Somebody who I was asking, so how do I avoid this tax? And I'm saying, okay, then don't, don't buy fuel. <laughs> don't buy fuel or don't take transport. Because, I mean, because definitely if the, the transport owners also incur this cost, they also find a way of passing on some to, to, to the consumer. So the only way to avoid this is probably to probably go green. Maybe start, start I mean, I asked somebody mentioned green bonds and other things. I'm sure this all become part of the discussions that we are currently having. Then also there's also the energy sector recovery levy, which has also added 20 pesos per liter as well. So in all, there's going to be a 30 pesos per liter for every fuel that we, we buy going for it if it is approved by parliament. Of course, we already have the energy sector recovery levy existing, what we call the ESLA. So there's an even an act for it that is already operating. So it's just only going to increase the amount of money that they, they way to pay of some of the debts and things that, that we owe. And of course, we see, if you look at the, the debt burden on the country, I believe that these are some of the areas that we can manage to also to reduce some of the burden on all of us. Because if the government borrows, the ultimate beneficiary or the people who suffer are the, both of us, who are all of us who are here. We will end up be the ones who have to pay. We are complaining the interest burden, almost 50% of our revenue generation. Who will have to pay it? We will have to pay it in, 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 in whichever way. So for us, that is the, the, the reality that we face. Once again, I will say that for businesses, we should then also know how to manage our energy cost and, and our power cost, because these are some of the areas that, that, that will increase our cost. And as I, I, mean, I jokingly said, to avoid it is not to buy fuel. But you cannot also avoid buying the fuel. All we need to do is just be, we need to be disciplined in the way we are doing our transactions and our activities. Road tools have been mentioned. So I will not probably I mean, re-emphasize that. So there is also going to be likely, the, the rate has not been fixed yet. So, but whatever that it is, is likely to be adjusted. How do we collect it? 
Prof said, people don't take the receipts. It's not only people who don't take the receipts. Sometimes when you are driving past, some car, big cars also drive past. Some people don't even pay at all. Some people don't pay at all. I mean, if, if you go and stand by the road, the Mamoto way, the, uh, the Kaswa one, quite a number of drivers just drive past and they don't pay. If you look at the published rates, they're supposed to be taking motorbikes. But I wonder how many of us here have seen any motor, any motor rider paying, paying the rates at, at any, any of the tow booths. They don't pay, but they are all supposed to have a race to pay. So it's about enforcement. About enforcement. If you don't ensure that people, are, I mean, the laws are enforced for people to pay, then we can continue to or complain that a few of us will be paying the taxes all the time. And if the government is looking for money and they cannot borrow, Definitely, then they will resort to the citizens to help the government run the activities of the nation. So to end my presentation on the key issues, I've already mentioned what can we do. I mean, I, I will say that for businesses, we need to be compliant. Because for some, the number of the benefits that the government has indicated in the budget, if you are not task compliant, you will not enjoy them. A number of businesses, especially the small ones, we do not file our returns. We do not even register with the Driven Authority. So when these kind of things come, you get to know that people are not able to take advantage of it because they do not have records at the, uh, the, the tax revenue. When the NBSSI came during the COVID time that they said people should go for those 100 million, and that way you will see people rushing now to even go and get tax identification number. They've been operating but they have never shown themselves in any way to, to also help in anything. So for businesses to take advantage of all this, please, let's comply. Let's register. Let's file our returns on time. Because these are also some of the things that the Revenue Authority look at. Are you, are you up to date with your records and other things? So that's one area that I, I would... Then, of course, sometimes also to get uh, funds for our operations, we also can also look at how do we raise our bills. You know, for VAT, for instance, for those doing the standard rate, it is paid at the end of the following month. So if you are in March, you will file your VAT returns at the end of April. So sometimes I ask myself, OK, so how can I get a room to utilize that amount of money for, for my own business? What we could do is plan and strategize, OK, you raise your bills maybe the first week of, let's say, March. So if you do your bills in the first week of March, what it means that you have advantage of utilizing that VAT money for 60 days be from the first week of March all the way to the end of, of, of April, instead of maybe waiting till raising your bills in, in, in last days of March. If you do that, you just have one month interval. So these are some of the things that we need to be looking at in our processes and in our activities. And of course, when we are in doubt, let's get consultants to assist. In this part of our world, people think that they can do their own way. As Prof said once again, people go walk to the driven to go and negotiate. And I keep saying, yes, you can go and negotiate today. Maybe they will take you a bit of money and they sort you out. But tomorrow, the issue is not gone. The issue is still there, staring at you. At you. If another person comes and then they open your file, your, your records are still there. So please, let's get the requisite experiences, the professionals to assist us. It may cost us, but that will be maybe one of cost that will then also harmonize your activities and your operations. Thank you very much. Very useful uh, tips there. We're so grateful uh, for this particular presentation. Uh, Mr. Kofi Frimpon, uh, Corey, the partner for KPMG, very useful information on the strategies to boost uh, business growth and value for the private sector. Interesting point on the need for businesses to be tax compliant and the need for them to delegate consultancy when the need be. Of course, this is the virtual seminar, as I keep st stating, live on Joy 99.7 FM. And it's all about the 2021 budget and how businesses can remain resilient and competitive amidst its interventions and specific introductions. Well, you speak to the banking fraternity, and one aspect of this budget, which is of grave concern to them, is introduction of the, as we all do know, the 5% on profit before tax. Uh, which was introduced in the budget. Already we've had the Ghana Bankers Association raising concern. The president has described this initiative as explosive and unproductive. Well, 
thankfully, we have one of the members of the fraternity here with us. He's the MD for Bank of Africa, the person of Mr. Kobe Anda. And just to have a little bit of appreciation of who this personality is, I want to read out a specific bio of his. And it stated that he started, uh, he took over as managing director for the Bank of Africa uh, since the bank took over the Amalgamated Bank in 2011. And he has over 25 years experience in the finance and banking industry. He has Ghanaian and international experience, having worked for KPMG, Securities Discount Company, the Trust Bank in Ghana, and the Gogolese Bank in London and Brussels, Sterling Bank PLC, Nigeria, and Bank of Africa, Tanzania Limited. Well, his experience spans several roles, including assurance, enterprise risk management, and financial control, with key strengths being strategy formulation and implementation, as well as people management. Well, Kobe is a chartered accountant as well, and has an MBA in finance and banking from the University of Wales, Bangor, and the Manchester Business School. And I'm pleased to announce that at this juncture, he's going to be speaking to us on the topic of access to credit and its implications for business growth in the 2021 national budget. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome him as he makes his presentation. Charles, thank you for the very kind words. Uh, Mr. President, um, panel, uh, I'll make specific special mention of the KPMG faculty because I'm a proud alumni of KPMG. And my friend, Ni, Ninoy, good to see you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of the chamber, my job here is basically to talk to you in 10 minutes about whether the financial sector has confidence to fuel the economy. The financial sector, I see, is like the blood that carries oxygen around the organs. Do we have the confidence that this budget gives us the confidence to continue that role and push the industries or the sectors that have suffered from this pandemic out of the hole they are in? To do this, I would show a slide on how this raving pandemic affected some sectors, the impact it had. I would go through what challenges the budget presents to us continue to finance the economy, and then I will end with some recommendations. Like I said, I'll try and do all this in the 10 minutes that have been allocated. So on, with the first slide I have, I show the impact of the sector, the uh, pandemic or the uh, challenges we went through last year in the, with the economy on various sectors. And you see the red line shows that the sector that suffered the most was the industry, which is maybe one of the most productive sectors we have. So that actually went into decline and went into a negative growth. We also see that the services sector also plunged. The sector that somehow held its own is the agri, which is very good because we have a lot of workers uh, 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 and uh, food security and all that. And I think this is due to maybe the initiatives that the government would put in place to boost agriculture. Some sectors suffered very deeply, and these are tourism, education, real estate uh, mainly. So when this happened, uh, some initiatives have been spoken about that were introduced by the government or uh, in the course of being introduced to kind of augment the decline and kind of give a stimulus to, to the productive sectors, service sectors as well, to boost them. One is the care program, which is a two billion guarantee scheme. This scheme is um, available to the Greek uh, manufacturing, hospitality, tourism, technology sectors, among others. And what this seeks to do is to share risk with the banks. So the objective is for banks to lend to these sectors, assess this two billion guarantee scheme, and reduce the cost of lending. Because with the guarantee, the risk is reduced for the bank, the risk premium therefore can go down, 
and therefore these sectors can the 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 uh, customers who assess this through the banks then can borrow at more affordable rates. There's also the CAP, this initiative of the NBSSI, which has been spoken about, which is a, initially started as a six billion, a six million CD uh, um, um, low, uh, facility available to cushion the COVID impact for small businesses. Uh, an additional 150 million was added to this. And, and then we have also the Ghana case or the Obatampan scheme, which has been also spoken about, which, um, like we heard from, uh, the, uh, from Ni, is about the biggest initiative that um, we have had to provide stimulus to industry. So we read, heard the budget. We all knew we had the last uh, difficult um, year last year. Um, we've spoken a, a lot about the fiscal deficit, but the deficit we know was due basically to three elements, uh, basically. One is the COVID, COVID expenditure, the other was the financial sector cleanup, and then the energy uh, over, uh, debt overhang, which we have to deal with. This reduced the uh, deficit or increased the deficit from about 4.4 to 11.7. Um, it's expected to recover to uh, a deficit of about 4.5 by 2024, which is a bit uh, of a long run. Um, I have a graph here which I wish we could show, which shows that um, the industry, the banking industry, even without the effects or the, of the deficit, uh, the problem the deficit presents is that it has to be financed. And in financing the deficit, it offers an alternative to banks and individuals in terms of asset allocation. So the decision um, a bank has to make or an individual who has money to put in a bank would have to make is to either um, lend to a customer like one of the members of the chambers with all the risk or to lend to government at very good rates. Government's uh, paper now are going uh, between, if I'm not wrong, 13 and 19 percent, depending on the tenor. So, if I have to take a decision of lending to a customer with all the inherent risk, or lending to government and going home to play golf and getting my high returns, making my shareholders uh, happy, um, it's kind of an easy choice to make. Um, or traditionally, the uh, over the past maybe three years or so, lending to um, the, uh, the private sector has been in decline, even before uh, COVID. Um, you take bank assets in, in uh, the, um, 2016, we're lending about 14% of our assets to the private sector. As of December 20, this had dropped to about 11%. So you take the total assets of the bank, only 11% of this is lent to uh, uh, the private uh, sector. And now, like as I, I, I said before, we have an alternative, or we've always had an alternative, but the alternative is being made larger because we hear, we hear from the budget that out of the deficit uh, that's being financed, um, about 25 billion of it is going to come from uh, the domestic debt financing uh, market, which means that it's going to be borrowed uh, locally. We don't know the profile of this borrowing, but this uh, rough estimates um, would push uh, the bank assets, the bank assets to government securities up from uh, about 43 percent of our balance sheet to about 48 percent of our balance sheet. So what this means is that we are crowding out the private sector. We are lending to government at the expense of the productive sectors of the economy. The other thing is also customers <laughs> who put deposits in banks and maybe at most will get something like 12 percent would migrate and put their money into government uh, uh, securities. But the largest pressure is going to come from the interest rates because for government to increase um, its, its stake by 25 billion, um, some kind of incentive would have to be given to the market. And this might come in the form of additional 
um, interest rates. So there are two elements here. One is the availability of liquidity. The second is the cost of the money to the private uh, 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 sector. Also, I mean, it has been said here, um, the additional cost that banks would have to incur, shareholders of banks would have to incur uh, because of uh, the budget. And one which has been spoken about is the 5% financial sector cleanup levy. Uh, somehow, we banks feel like we are like a sitting duck. It's uh, as if, because we publish, we are, we are compelled by law to publish our accounts, and the profit numbers look large. Um, it's, it look, it, it's, it's very easy to just go and uh, tax the banks without thinking through what implication this has uh, on other services that the banks uh, grant. I heard uh, my colleague here saying that the banks have benefited from the financial sector cleanup. That, uh, in many ways, you can say that, but I can assure you that the cost of compliance, the uh, softwares you have to buy, the reports you have to submit, the staff, quality of staff you have to have to comply to regulatory demands is very expensive. And also, the fact that the numbers are, look large does not necessarily mean that the, the minimum capital for a bank is 400 million. So if I make a profit of 100 million, the, the return on equity is not out of the market. It doesn't, it, it doesn't, it is not larger than the returns other uh, sectors uh, make. But what I find um, uh, even more difficult to understand, it's, it's, it gives the impression that the good banks are being punished for surviving the crisis. We wonder why don't we have transparency in the receivership process? If our monies have been used to bail out these banks, receivers have been appointed, we need to know what is happening. We, we, can, you, we can't just dump the burden on somebody else uh, to pay. I think these are issues that have to be uh, looked at critically. There's, there's a need for more transparency. We need to know what's happening with the prosecutions. We need to know how much has been recovered. This, the, 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 it has to be transparent. The 1% increase in VAT was also spoken about. Uh, banks would uh, incur this uh, as well as other um, um, uh, participants of the economy. But the risk I see there with the 1% and then the 30% uh, a little uh, cumulative, is that everybody, like I say, everybody has to pay. So really, it's, 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 it cuts across board. But this is going to increase the cost of business. The, the, the business already, businesses are struggling. We've heard certain things are being given. But net-net, there's an additional burden. And sometimes I wonder, um, um, we talk, there was talk about the AFTA, AFCTA. Um, it can be all nice and rosy on paper, but at the end of the day, we are opening up our markets. Um, a customer uh, or an SME in Cote d'Ivoire borrows at 5%, his cost is lower. Now, if he comes onto our market, can our SMEs compete? Can our, can our SMEs also assess um, their markets? These are things we also have to consider. So, some suggestions. And um, uh, I, I humbly, uh, I hope doc, uh, Dr. Nino is listening. <laughs> some suggestions. One is, we know what the issues are. We've all spoken about them. We've spoken about two serious cost lines, interest and wages and salaries. This budget has not factored wages and salaries at all. Um, if you look at the budget, you see that over the previous year, wages and salaries, I think, in, uh, increased the cost. I, I mean, I'm not saying salaries were increased, but the cost the numbers increased by about 32%. It's not sustainable. Some serious conversations have to be had with labor. I mean, it, we, we have to do this together. We, we have to let everybody understand what the realities are. The question is, we pay wages, government wages. What is the link to productivity? Whether you are productive or not, you get your salary. We should have a core salary, and then there should be any additional you make based on your pr productivity. There should be 
uh, a productivity metrics for every job in the public sector. And you, 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 you earn what you've actually, the value you've actually um, added to, 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 to the pie. I think this has to be considered seriously. We, 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 I remember um, some uh, um, um, years ago, there was a lot of reform in the wage market where salaries were consolidated to make sure that um, 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 em employees benefited fully from pensions, etc. But over time, these benefits have <laughs> been lost. We've all gone back to the allowances and all. I think some serious work has to be done there. Also, the second tab, which is the interest uh, uh, bedding, where we say about 50%. You put these two together, it's like 90%. So what it means is that eliminate 10%, everything else we spend is borrowed. It's borrowed either for investment or consumption, right? So on the interest burden, I know uh, when this government um, came into place, there was a lot of interest profiling, reprofiling to reduce the burden of the capital payments. Uh, some renegotiations were done. But the space that was created was used to borrow more. So we are back to where we are already. And maybe we have to revisit this agenda again. I mean, uh, truly, if we pursue the course we are in, I will not be surprised if uh, we have to go and ask for some reliefs somewhere along the line. Maybe it's not a bad thing to consider looking at the impact of COVID and the availability uh, uh, of the capital markets to look at things like that. But we have to. We have to tackle the issue. We have to try and reduce the burden. If we don't get these two lines under control, um, uh, all that we do um, uh, will we'll, 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 we'll not get us um, anywhere. The, the other um, issue um, um, is, and this I'm talking to us as banks, um, we should understand that when the times were good, our customers were good, we made money out of them. Times are difficult, we have to support the customers. We have to give some forbearance, we have to maybe look at interest payments, we have to look at some uh, uh, re restructuring. I know a lot of banks, including ourselves, have done this. We have a, a, a scheme we call the oxygen, where uh, we look at a turn of one year to help. I mean, you look at schools, obviously they have cash flow problems. Um, restaurants, hotels, so banks we should help uh, 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 right help these customers ride the storm, and then when the good days come, uh, 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 we share the prospects uh, or the benefits with 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 with, with our with our uh, customers. I think the central bank has also been uh, very helpful. Um, um, uh, they reduced the uh, provision rates uh, for uh, uh, accounts that have just slipped to about 8%. Uh, percent. I hope this will continue going forward. I know negotiations have been done with the uh, Ghana Bankers Association and the Central Bank, and I think uh, this um, is going to happen. This will help make banks more comfortable um, um, to lend. Also, the Central Bank uh, reduced the primary reserve um, to 8%, which, um, and the, the, the governor made sure this money went to uh, the, the market. The, he made sure we didn't use that money to buy uh, treasury bills, and I think this helped uh, ride uh, the, the, the storm and helped some um, um, private sector companies to survive, survive the uh, wave. In addition to this, uh, we might, like Oliver Twist, we always ask for more. We might uh, request the uh, governor through the uh, Ghana Banks Association to also relook really at the need for us to cover foreign deposits with CD uh, depo the deposits with the central bank. What happens is if you bring your dollar to me, I have to go and borrow CDs to reserve the 8%. So there's a, a, a mismatch there, and it makes it quite expensive. So this, uh, if this is done, that you cover with the same currency, it will give some relief uh, and ease some cash, some liquidity that we can unlend. Um, to uh, the market. And then to you, members of the chamber, I mean, borrowing, the price of borrowing is a factor of two things. Basically, no matter how you look at it, it's two things. One is the cost of money, and two is the risk premium. So if you can't control the cost of money, you can't control your risk premium. A lot was said um, about compliance for tax, but this compliance should not just be for tax. It should be because it's the right thing to do that you keep proper books, uh, proper governance, you give banks the confidence 
to lend uh, to you and, uh, and know that the risk is manageable. So, Mr. Uh, President, on this note, uh, I would um, end with, um, with a slightly, slightly uh, jovial uh, note. And um, when I was coming, my daughter asked to see the program. Uh, I told Clement <laughs> about this. And um, she said, how come the panel is all male? How come there's no female on the panel? And then she cracked the joke that, oh, she's seen two females on it. One is saying the opening prayer, and one is saying the closing <laughs> prayer. So <laughs> I think maybe <laughs> subsequently we should bear that in mind and have a, a, a more gender balanced uh, panel. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I'm so grateful, uh, Mr. Kobe, the MD for Bank of Africa. Interesting, he raised uh, <laughs> the gender issue. We're so grateful for <laughs> that particular one. But quite candid statements that he's uh, made, I believe one of which could make the headlines. It looks like the good banks <laughs> seems to be punished for surviving the banking sector cleanup. But aside from that, he's raised also very valid points. The need for interest and wages and salaries to be reviewed, especially when it's taking a chunk of expenditure, about 90% in this regard. Well, it has been a very interesting journey. Uh, we've had several hosts of presentations so far that I wish to recap before we have the next speaker on board. Uh, we've had the discussion on the macroeconomic performance and its implications for businesses and the entire uh, business environment by Professor Peter Corte, very enlightening statement that he gave. And also on taxation, the strategies to boost business growth and value for the private sector by Mr. Kofi from Pond Corey of KPMG, a very insightful presentation as well. And of course, the business support and special initiatives for banks uh, building resilience in post-COVID era by Mr. Evans Boatin as well of KPMG. And just gone by was the MD for Bank of Africa, Mr. Kobe Anda, on the need to access credit and its implications for business growth in 2021. Well, helping us put this all into perspective, especially coming from the macroeconomic and fiscal management, as well as its implications uh, for the private sector. We are glad to have here once again the senior advisor at the Ministry of Finance, Dr. Samuel Anton Ashon. But just before he comes, a little bit of introduction of who this gentleman is. Of course, Dr. Ashon's area of expertise is primarily in economics. He holds a PhD in economics from Boston University, an MA in economics from Queen's University, Ontario, Canada, and a Bachelor of Arts in economics with statistics from the University of Ghana, Legon. And of course, he has served as a member of the Ministerial Advisory Board of the Ministry of Finance and has also been a member of the Technical Committee of the Public Utilities and Regulatory Commission, PLC of Ghana. He served on several other governing boards, both in the private and public sector, including, including Capital Group, GBC Limited, the National Board for Small Scale Industries, and the National Development uh, Planning Commission. So I dare say that you are all in safe hands. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome once again, Dr. Samor Ashon. Thank you. I think you could do it better for him as he makes it. Thank you once again, and uh, <coughs> greetings from the, the ministry. Can you, can you put our slide for, okay, good. <coughs> now we're going to start we're going to look at the global context. And, uh, yes. COVID-19 impact on global economic growth. 
And the next table will tell you that the, the pandemic devastated the world economy in 2020. It led to economic contraction in many countries, significant slowdown in recession in some, and others, and stagnation in some. If you, the world economy is of the global economy contracted by 3.5%. Advanced countries together, 4.9%. UK, specifically 10% 10, 10 contraction. The EU area, 7.2%. Japan, 5%. US, 3.4%. So all the big ones contracted in 2020. When it comes to emerging markets and developing economies, the group contraction was 2.4%. India, 8% contraction. Russia, 3.6%. While China, which co caused the whole problem, they didn't contract, but they slowed down. <laughs> they, they, their growth slowed down, but uh, they didn't contract. Somehow, they were able to contain the thing at a very early stage. If you come to Sub-Saharan Africa, we contracted as a group 2.6%. The big one, South Africa, there's 7.5%. If you come to ECOWAS, again, the construction of 2.5%. Nigeria, 3.2%. It is only, uh, so you have Ghana, a state above water. We grew by more or less 0.9%. So we slowed down in growth. And every, every cost also moved down from 6.5% in 2019 to 1.8%. So, you see, COVID 19 had a huge impact on economic activity across the, across the globe. If you come to ECOWAS, of the 15 countries, only five registered positive growth in 2020, and Ghana was one of the five. The others are Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea, Niger, Togo actually was flat. Togo stagnated. Can you move the slide, please? Now, Ghana's growth performance, let's let the, this slide is not on, but let me just give you some background. If you look at the quarterly rates, growth rate for Ghana, in 2020, you realize that there was positive growth in the fourth quarter before COVID hit. Quarters one and two contracted. And quarter three, we got some uh, growth, positive growth. But if you look at it by sector, that the broad sectors, the oil sector actually ended the year with a negative with a contraction of 6.2%. And uh, it is not far-fetched. There was a, a decline in production, as well as a reduction in the prices on the world market also. The non-oil sector grew by 1.6% over the course of the year. Now, if you also look at formal versus informal sector, the informal sector, which accounted for 27.4% of uh, national output, in 2020, grew by 3.6%. The former sector stagnated, didn't grow at all, 0%. So you can see why you are not getting your revenues. Because the informal sector usually, we don't get enough taxes from them. All your taxes, majority come from the formal sector. <laughs> if the sector is not growing, of course your revenues are not going to be growing in taxes and other things. So that is the background. Uh, the next chart, the person controlling the stuff. Chart number six on your, now. Ghana, yeah, the, no, that, the one before this. Yes, right. Now you can see from the chart, the impact of COVID-19 in 2020. The blue line is the trajectory uh, we were supposed to embark on prior to the COVID. And the, the the orange line is the recalibration at mid-year, and the green line is where we are, we are now uh, in the, for this year's budget. So we're supposed to be doing 6.8%. 
we ended up doing 0 0.9. So you can see the big, big dive. And that big dive, if you go to the next chart, tells you that you were knocked off your trajectory or, or, or trend, and you are now moving, you are now operating on a lower plat platform, lower growth platform. There it is. The blue line without COVID is where we have been going. And the green line with COVID is where we are, we are heading towards now. So even in 2024, we will not come back to normal if things move the way they are. So if you look at the next one, your nominal growth rates, your nominal, now this is a level, your, your nominal GDP upon which the taxes are linked, the income-based taxes are linked, is also operating on the lower uh, plateau. And therefore, even with the same rates, you are not going to be collecting the revenue you collected before. Now, if you look at the next chart, you see that this is the estimated output loss due to COVID. In 2020, in real terms, we lost 10.4 billion. In nominal terms, 14.7 billion. So this 14.7 billion is not, it's not going to be available for you to tax. That, that's the bottom line. This year, 18.9 billion is not going to be available. 2022, about 26 million, billion, and 2023, 40. Four billion. This is the this is the difficulty that you have because of COVID. It has moved you. It has devastated both activities and even human beings who, who are supposed to be generating these activities. So you have a double whammy. So it's not just numbers who have been lost, but what could what they could be doing is also very important. So what are the implications of COVID? of this output loss, revenue used from taxes and levies whose basis are linked to income generation activities are going to be negatively impacted. Proposed revenue generation from taxes and levies must therefore be designed in ways that would not stifle production because these this, uh, sectors are already uh, uh, reeling from the impact of COVID. Proposed taxes may must be directed to sectors whose performances were fortuitously boosted by the pan pandemic and the budget, the banking sector and the communication sector <laughs> were listed. And Ms. Anda here uh, has given his opinion about it. But see, the financial sector is an essential part of national security. If you don't safeguard it, your whole economy will run down. And therefore, the, bank, the, the failing banks had to be cleaned up from the system in order to avoid a run, a run, a run on, the, on the other banks, right? So money was used for that national security aspect. And that we are saying that in the, in the next few years, maybe not forever, we are all asking everybody to chip in so that we enjoy this stability, the financial sector. So that is the basis for why this levy was imposed. Consumption-based tax standards, given the circumstances, are more appropriate in the current framework, since they are more broad-based and therefore less distortionary. Well, everybody consumes. In this area, not everybody is earning income. But through other uh, uh, government programs which are questioning consumers and households. They will express their mandate on the market through consumption. And that's why you got to catch them. No. Not everybody is earning income. So this is the time for burden sharing. Government rolled out very costly programs to save lives and protect their livelihoods in 2020. More expenditures are envisaged to achieve a comfortable degree of herd immunity and also deal with any lingering effects of the pandemic in the medium term. And this must be funded. So where do you get the money? If your income is not growing, in fact, stagnated, if I operating at a lower level, the only way you, the only way you can get back is to increase income tax rates, 
which is a no-no, and therefore you have to look elsewhere, consumption taxes, you know, until you get back to a, 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 a level where businesses will be, uh, will be operating at full throttle, and then they will be uh, contributing to the national commerce as expected. Obviously, uh, GRE has a role to play in terms of efficiency in collection, expanding the net themselves, you know, make sure that uh, we do more automation, we, we look at the gaming industry, online, cons online, uh, business, online uh, business transactions. How do we move the modern times to also uh, capture that market and bring some coffers, some money into the national coffers? Now, government revenues, resource envelope, and broad expenditure categories. Yes. Okay. Now, when we talk about the resource envelope, when you do the, the budget, first of all, you don't spend what you don't have. And the, 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 the uh, rule number one in budgeting is that you must determine what you can amass. So we have anchored our budget on the fiscal deficit. So you meet with cabinet and decide how much room do you have in terms of deficit? Because the, the, the constitution allows you to borrow, to plug any deficit hole, and also for other things, uh, uh, management of your debt and all that, liability management. Now you also have to, you also have to uh, be aware that Apart from the deficit, these other sources of, these other reasons for borrowing will also, what, increase your national debt, uh, debt uh, government guarantees and all those. So through all these combinations, you strike a deficit. And that deficit will allow you how much, how much you can borrow, giving your revenue generation, both taxes and non-tax, and your grants from donors. So these are your grants, your domestic revenue, and the tax grant that you have, and the, the, any addition in terms of financing, together will give you the envelope you can, you can then go and uh, spend on. So in 2020, we budgeted that we're going to do what? Uh, I don't have the budget, but in 2019, the total envelope was 16.7 billion. No, 69.7 billion. In 20, uh, and we were supposed to borrow 16.7 billion to cover the shortfall. In 2020, when COVID hit and we revised the framework, that envelope went to 97.9, 97.7 billion. Almost 30, 30 billion more. You had to borrow 42 billion of that to be able to run the economy. Otherwise, the economy will crash. Saving lives and livelihood was a number one thing. You cannot, it's something you cannot postpone. You can chop, you can say you want to run nine deficits, low inflation, and all those things. But by the time, if you fix on that, if you are fixated on that and don't look at the impact of COVID, you achieve all those targets nicely, but you end up with dead people all over. And that is not what we all wish for ourselves or for anybody else. So we had to do what it takes, whatever it took, to save lives. And this is how we come. We had to borrow a lot. As you can see, we even plan to sell national assets, 1.7 billion divestiture. When, it, when the dust settles, we ended up borrowing 44 point, almost 45 billion. The envelope moved to 100.1 billion. Domestic revenue, you can see in 20, 19, we collected 52 billion. COVID year, 52.4 billion. So that we only we budgeted for only 0.4 billion more because of the realities on the ground. We couldn't collect revenues, and we ended up with only 54 billion. So, as you can see, uh, this uh, this uh, borrowing is going to stay with us next year. This year is 41.3 billion. Next year, almost 37, 2023, 30, and then 2024, 
around the 7 billion, and then maybe into the million, 20, 20, 25 and beyond, we'll come back to more number of times. But right now, this is where we are. Uh, we, need, we need to be relying more on borrowed funds to run the economy. And the implications for what? For interest rate payments. I, now, government brought expenditures. As I said, interest payments, you borrow money. If you don't pay the interest, or if you don't service the loan, interest and principal, next time you go, nobody is going to give you money. The bankers are here. So as for interest payments, you've got to pay. It becomes a, it's, it's, it's mandatory. It's, 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 it's something, it's, it's contractual. So if you, if, you, if you take off the interest payments, the rest of your non-debt expenditures, you come to your total. So your interest payments in 2019, about 28.9% 20, of total expenditure, including areas. The reverse budget, we said we're going to do 26.9, and we ended up with 25.1. But because of the borrowing we did in 2020, this year, the interest payments are about 31, almost 32% of total expenditure plus areas. Next year, about the same, 2023, 31%. Again, 2024, 29%. So this is the, the, the what COVID-19 has done for us. It took 8.4% of our expenditures in what? 2020, as you can see, it's going to taper on as we move down. So what, what are the balances? We've already talked about them. Uh, Professor Quarty has talked about them. You are running 11.7 billion. I got you. And then we're going to taper down to 4.5. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, the presentation by uh, Dr. Samuel Anshan will continue shortly. But in the meantime, this is how we call it uh, buys for our audience on JAW 99.7 FM as well as JAW News Channel as we cross over to our studios there for the news at midday. But in the meantime, we're grateful that you joined us. It has been the Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industries virtual seminar on the 2021 uh, budget and its implications for businesses. We have had interesting discussions and presentations from all of our, our speakers. Our headline sponsors in this regard has been McDonald's Shipping Company Limited and Bank of Africa Group. We are partners, Joy Business, uh, thankfully, together with Ghana Web and other media partners. For me and the rest of the audience and presenters here, we say thank you very much for being a part of the discussion. But in the meantime, for us here in the Shippers House, the discussion continues with Dr. Anshon on the macroeconomic and financial, the fiscal management and its implications for the private sector. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So <clears throat> the implication is that with this borrowing, your debt stock as a ratio of GDP is now 76.1% for 2020, moving from 62.4%. This includes both the COVID effect, the financial sector bailout, and the energy sector uh, IPP capacity charges. Now, so somebody will ask, why is this important? What well, U.S. may be running a deficit to GDP ratio of over 100, but the interest rate, the interest cost, the interest expense on uh, the service charge on that is low because the interest rates are right now 1%, 2%. Interest rates are high. That is why we have to be very careful. 